There is no other king. He is more wonderful than my mind, your mind can comprehend today. He is more powerful, more amazing, more terrifying. To live in his absence is terrifying because it is only his goodness that has assembled the people in this room today. It is the mercy and grace of God that has gathered us to celebrate a resurrection of the dead, a freedom that we would never know without him. We would never experience without him. There is no other king able to do what he has done. There is no other king that would do what he has done if he were able. Death, burial, resurrection. This is the message of Christ, and this is the message of Easter. We wear it on t-shirts. This shirt had its origin when we started putting them backstage. When somebody came to be baptized, we would put this shirt on them to celebrate what's happening in the baptistry. What's happening when a person is born again of the water and born again of the Spirit? Jesus says that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again of the water and the Spirit. And what is happening? There's a death. <clears throat> Nobody is forced to go and to be buried in the water. A person decides that on their own. They decide that I come to deny myself. I come to surrender my life to a power greater than myself. I bow to this king that I have not seen, though I believe he is real and true. Death, the death of me. Burial. When we take someone into the baptistry, we take them under the water. That you're actually following Jesus into his death as he goes to the cross. Into his burial as he goes to the grave. And something always happens. When we bring someone out of the water of baptism, they always do the same thing. You know what it is? It's a good idea to do that after you go in the water. It's a new breath. To be born again of the water, to be born again of the Spirit. A new life, a new person. And here's why. There's a promise that if we will follow Him into His death, if we will follow Him into His burial, if we will follow Him into His resurrection by faith, the Holy Spirit, Christ Himself, will move inside of us. That He will live in us in the form of the Spirit. And He will empower us to walk a life that we cannot walk on our own. To do things we could never do on our own. To live in a hope and a freedom we would never know without this King. Death, burial, resurrection. This year I've chosen this Easter season to review these three topics. Why? It is impossible to understand Easter until you understand the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ and what it means to us today. The first session called death, we talked about this terrible word. It's an enemy. Death is an enemy. It doesn't belong here. In the beginning, there was no death. There was only life. And then the enemy from outside of our world, Satan, came and delivered an enemy called death to this planet. And it's been here ever since. And the enemy is still here, Satan. It's a terrible word. Nobody in this room wants somebody to come to your house and say, there's been death. It's a powerful word. Death can assemble a crowd in a room. Death is an enemy to life itself. We talked about the second Adam, how Jesus is the second Adam, the one that brought victory over death, that the enemy brought death to the first Adam, but then a second Adam, the last Adam, came to give us victory. But last week we talked about how does he do it? How did he give us victory over death? This is the meaning and the purpose of Easter. Victory over the grave. Victory over death. But how? Jesus was buried. But there would be no need for a burial if he was not dead. People today are buried. And there's no reason for a burial if there's not death. 
To understand the topic of burial, you must understand the topic of death. When Jesus, the last Adam, the second Adam comes, he experienced death, he experienced burial, he experienced the resurrection. He is the second Adam. <clears throat> and here's what makes his, his sacrifice unique and powerful. He is the second Adam, and he is perfect in every way. But there is something unique about him. Of all the billions of people who ever lived on planet Earth, there is only one. Listen, there is only one who doesn't trace his father's 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 father to Adam. Only one. And everyone from Adam's genealogy, everyone from Adam's seed is under the curse of Adam, the curse of death. But there was one who didn't come from Adam. His father was not from Adam. His father was God. So he comes unique as the son of God, not from the sons of Adam. But there's something else about him that's unique. He came from a woman. He was birthed from Mary's womb. So he is the son of man and the son of God in the same person. Nobody else can carry two titles. He is the Son of Man and the Son of God wrapped in a single person. If Jesus is not from Adam, <clears throat> if He is not from Adam, then He's not under the curse, right? If He's not under the curse and the curse is death, then Jesus can't die. But He is from woman. He is in a human body. And because he is in a human body, he has made himself, God put his glory inside of human flesh. He put him, his person inside of human flesh and subjected himself. Listen, the God of glory subjects himself to human death, makes it possible to die. He which knows no death, has no death, is under no curse of death, becomes death. Why? Why? I want to read it to you. Hebrews 2.14. This will be the foundation today. Because God's children are human beings. Made of flesh and blood. That's who we are. The Son, of, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being. <clears throat> he had to leave his eternal form. Only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Only by becoming a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. And what is the power of the devil? Who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Only in this way can you and I know what freedom is. Only in this way he became a man. And because God put himself inside a human body, a human body that was subject to death, he could die. And why would he do that? Not for himself. He did not do it for himself. He did it because only in this way could you and I be set free from the power of sin and death. Here's the reality. Everyone born of Adam is a slave to sin. We're all under the curse. And that last sentence, verse 15, only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to what? The fear of dying. In your future, in my future, somewhere there's a gravestone. It's mine. And Jesus became a man. Jesus died. He beca God became flesh, put himself inside a human body, subjected himself to death, even death on a cross. Why? So that you and I could be set free from the future death. How? It's called the resurrection. And last week I explained something. I want to begin today by explaining it again. You see, the reason that I don't fear the ultimate death, I don't fear a, a tombstone with my name on it, though one day, if the Lord tarries, they may put me in the ground in a box and put me in the ground and put a name on a stone. But I don't, I'm not a slave to the fear of death. You know why? Because I've already experienced it. Listen carefully. I have already experienced the death and the burial. I died with Christ. 
I have been buried with Christ. And now I wait for the resurrection of Christ. Because I have experienced the death, the only death that I will know. See, Jesus in a graveyard told Lazarus, told Mary and Martha about Lazarus, that if you live and believe in me, you will never die. If you live and believe in me, your body might be planted somewhere, but you will never die. Why? Because you've already experienced death. You've already died to yourself. You've already been buried with Christ in baptism. You know, what we're waiting for is the resurrection. I've already done the death. I've already done the burial. Have you? When we're united with Him, all we're waiting for is the resurrection. The only man that ever walked on earth that was perfect and exempt from the curse of Adam, and yet he died. He really did die. Jesus said on the cross these three words, it is finished. The payment for sin had been made. But there was one more thing that had to happen. His death, his burial, but then there's one more thing. On the third day, the resurrection. A man would do, need to do what a man cannot do. He would need to go into a grave, stand up, and walk out. The first Adam died. We assume that he was buried. It was over. It was finished. He stayed in the grave. His body turned to dust. But I'll ask you, what about the second Adam? What about Jesus? He is the second Adam. He was dead like the first Adam, and he was buried like the first Adam. But he's not finished. He did not stay in the ground, and his body did not turn to dust. You can't break the power of death, overcome this enemy invasion without the resurrection of the dead. I'm talking, when I talk today about the resurrection of the dead, I'm talking about a physical, bodily resurrection, not just a spirit moving to another place. Don't think about yourself in this context. Let's do something. I want you right now to imagine maybe it's a grandparent or a great-grandparent who was a believer and they have been dead and they have been buried. Death, burial, the first two of these three topics. Let's be specific. Let's think about Peter. Let's think about Andrew, James, John, the Apostle Paul. They have been dead and buried for a long time. They have all experienced the first two of these three part in the series. They are believers. They have died and been buried. Their bodies have turned to dust. There is something coming. I want you to understand the reason we assemble and sing today. There is something coming. The resurrection. The resurrection, the most marvelous thing that I can think about the resurrection, are you ready? It cures death 100% of the time. If you die and you are raised from the dead, death has been conquered. It has been cured. Again, I'm talking about a physical, bodily resurrection from the dead and the buried grave. When I was a kid growing up at my home church at Corinth, there was a Sunday school class, and the teacher taught us a song. And I never forgot the song. Are you ready for this song? Because here it comes. <clears throat> them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones going to rise again. Now, We've learned that song. It comes from the book of Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, here's what happens. God takes Ezekiel out into this huge field, and it's filled with, listen, it's filled with corpses. Bones everywhere. Broken apart bones, scattered about bones. And God looks at Ezekiel and says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel looks at God and says, oh God, only you know where these bones can live. And God says, watch. He's, he's showing a future event. Then he says, watch 
Ezekiel, and suddenly the, the Bible says that Ezekiel heard a rattling noise and the bones started to come together and they, they started to connect and people started to stand up like skeletons and then he saw flesh and sinews and he saw the, all the muscles start to come on and then skin came over them. But then there was no breath in the bodies. And Ezekiel, can you imagine Ezekiel witnessing this scene? A vast army, but there's no breath and God, he breathes. And these bones become alive. God is showing Ezekiel something that he plans to do in the future. Them bones are going to rise again. Not a spirit getting up and flying off to distant places, but a human body. Not a zombie getting up and walking around. But I'm talking about new life. I'm talking about eternal life. This is the meaning of Easter. So let's go back and read the story. I want to read Matthew 28. It is after the death and after the burial, and their hearts are broken. They feel like everything is lost. Darkness has overwhelmed them until Sunday morning. Matthew 28. Early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. And then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid, he said. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. Do you understand the power of those words? He's not here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. He's not here. I want to change perspective. It's not just that Jesus is not there. Listen. Dead and buried is not there. Dead and buried is gone. Dead and buried has just been defeated. It's not here anymore. De dead and buried is not the end anymore. Dead and buried is the beginning now in Christ. It's not the end. Do you understand what just happened? This isn't just about Jesus rising from the dead. It's about you rising from the dead. People assemble on Easter, and I'm afraid so many times we come and we celebrate what Jesus did. And that's worth our honor, and that's worth our glory, and that's worth our praise. But understand something. This event is not about Jesus rising from the dead. It's about you rising from the dead. He didn't come from heaven to get eternal life. He already had eternal life. He didn't come to give angels eternal life. He came to give you eternal life. This celebration is about the fact that we've been set free from dead and buried. It's not my future. Because I've already been dead and buried. I've already died with Christ. I've already been raised with Christ as a new creature. I'm just waiting for the resurrection of the last day. Jesus was God in the flesh. Do you understand who He is? He is God in the flesh. He didn't need to come to earth to experience eternal life. In John chapter 1, can, you, can your mind grasp who He is? It says, in the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Jesus, and nothing was created except through Jesus. He didn't need to come to the earth and go to the cross. He didn't need to do that for Him. He didn't need to do that for angels. He needed to do that because that's the only way you're going to survive. He did it for you. The resurrection is not about Him. The resurrection was about the love of God that would sacrifice His only Son for you. The resurrection was to cure your death. He's not here. What's not here? Dead and buried. It's vanquished. It's vanquished. In John 8, verse 57, 
Jesus is having this discussion with these religious guys. And the religious guys, if you read the context, they just didn't believe that he was who he says he was. He says his father's God, that he came from heaven. And they can't get it. They're not getting it. So here's the conversation. The people said, verse 57, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? you got to understand, Abraham predates Christ by 2,000 years. You're not even 50 years old. And you say you've seen Abraham? How's that possible? Jesus' answer, next verse, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Do you know who he is? Jesus did not come to the earth to die for himself. He came to the earth to die for you. He doesn't need a resurrection. He is eternal life. But you need a resurrection. He came to give it to you and to give it to me. To give what? To give what? To give us a death. To give us a burial. And to give us a resurrection. He's not here. The angel of the Lord announced he's not here. The grave is empty. The physical body of Jesus is gone. It's not here. Just as he said, Jesus had told them in advance this was coming. He had told them over and over and over. What did he say? The Son of Man must enter Jerusalem. He's going to die. And he's going to raise from the dead. Let me read it to you. Can your mind grasp it? Because quite frankly, they had a hard time. Matthew 16, 21. Advanced knowledge. From then on, Jesus began to tell the disciples plainly that it was necessary. It's God's will for him to enter Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed. He's telling them this before he ever goes to Jerusalem. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Now he's announced it clearly. He he explains it without riddles or parables. But Peter, verse 22, Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap for me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. It's hard to grasp. It's hard for them to grasp. Peter didn't get it. He says that I must go to Jerusalem. I must die. I must be raised from the dead. It is hard to grasp because we've always seen dead and buried as the end, right? Dead and buried is the red line. Peter says, I can't. I have a responsibility, Jesus, to keep you away from the red line. You're not going to get dead and buried, not on my watch. We think we must do everything to stop dead and buried. We live our lives thinking that we should do everything possible to stop dead and buried. Why? Because no one crosses the red line. And certainly no one crosses the red line and comes back. No one. Well, that's true for the sons of Adam. But that is not true for the sons, the children of God through Christ. Peter thinks like us in this scene. Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen. I'm never going to let you get dead and buried in Jerusalem. And Jesus does what? Listen, church. He calls Peter Satan. This is how dead people talk, Peter. See, Satan is condemned to death. And Peter's talking like a dead man. I will never let this happen. You must change your thinking and believe the promises of God and the prophetic announcement of God. Do you know what the very next verse says after he tells Peter, get away from me, Satan. I hope you're ready for this. The next verse Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my followers, you must turn from your selfish ways. And you've got to take up a cross. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to get a cross. He's going to voluntarily take a cross. 
and says, anyone wants to be my followers, you've got to turn from your self-centered life and you've got to take your own cross and follow me. And if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. Do you see the death and the burial and the resurrection? If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? This is big. Can you see it? Peter's trying to stop dead and buried. And Jesus calls him Satan. Why? Because Jesus wants us to embrace dead and buried. Not natural dead and buried from the sons of Adam, but a new life dead and buried that comes through Christ. We need to embrace it so we can follow him into the resurrection of eternal life. Do you see it? Focus on verse 25. Let's look at 25. Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. So let's visualize something. Let's say this is your soul. This is my soul. This is the, my person. There's this idea that if I can hold it to myself, that I can save my life by hanging on to my life, that I keep it close to me. I don't let anybody else touch it. I, I keep it close to me. It's the idea that Peter is following Jesus into Jerusalem. Jesus says, I'm going to go and get dead and buried. And Peter says, no, no, no. And he calls him Satan because Jesus knew that to save our life, he would have to release his life. And then he says, you've got to follow me into my death. You've got to follow me into my burial. You've got to follow me into my resurrection. So here it is. I have freedom to decide what to do with my life. I have a freedom. What I will do with my soul. And here's what Jesus says. Terry, you will have to lay it down. If you try to save your life, Terry, you will lose your life. But if you will lose your life for my sake, you will save your life. So what do I have to do? I have to die to myself. What is the cross? It is the death of me. It is the surrender of me. It is the yielding of my life to an authority beyond me. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you died to yourself? If any of you wants to be my followers, you must deny yourself. You must change from a self-centered life that's all about you controlling you, and you must be willing to take your life and lay it down at the foot of the cross and allow Jesus to become the master. Go to verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up a cross, and follow me. Follow me where? Into the grave. You gotta die. Dead and buried. Verse 26. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? And you live your, let's say you live your 70 years, or you live your 80 years, or you live your 90 years, and you've held, retained control of your life. And then at the last day, you get dead and buried and you lose your soul. What was it worth? What's the value of your soul? Death, burial, resurrection, follow me into all three. So I'm going to ask everybody in the audience a question today. Don't answer out loud, but answer honestly to yourself, please. Have you been dead and buried in Christ? Have you died to yourself? Taken up a cross to follow Him? Here's where I'm going. See, when I was a a young man, I, I came to the conclusion that I needed a Savior. I doubt there's anybody in the room today that doesn't one day think you're going to need a Savior. Somebody is going to need bigger than you need to save you. So it's kind of like having this Savior card in your back pocket that I don't need it right this minute, but one day I will need it. I want to pull out my wallet, and I've got the Savior card, Jesus saved me. But for Him to be your, sa- your Savior, He must also be your Lord. And you know what Lord means? Master. And that means that you must deny yourself, take up a cross, and follow him. Is that describe who you are? You must die to be born again. You cannot be born again. Jesus says you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. The only way you can be born again is that the first you dies. You must surrender your life to Christ. 
It is the death of me. Do you see why Jesus calls Peter Satan? Because this is a battle for the human heart. A battle for the human soul. In my 25 years of ministry, I've noticed something consistent. When someone comes to genuinely repent of their sins, confess Christ, and be born again in baptism, almost certainly they're crying. Why? Sometimes it's ugly. There's snot coming out of their nose. It's a mess. We keep Kleenexes up here. Well, why? Why? Why are they doing that? Are they allergic? What is it? Their spirit is broken. They see themselves as God sees them. They deny themselves. And to do that, it's against your nature. It's against my nature. My nature is what? To retain control of my own authority. To retain control of my life. But the fact is, you can't save your life. And if you don't give up your life, you will lose your life. And God sent His Son to become a man to do what you would never do on your own. And even if you could do it, you wouldn't save yourself. What? He went to the cross. He was buried in the ground. And He rose. And He stands up and He says two words. Follow me. Follow me into the resurrection. Follow me into eternal life. Follow me into the glory of my Father. But everything inside of you doesn't want to do it. It's a battle. It's a battle of the human spirit. We want to resist the very thing that would save us. Death, burial, and resurrection. We all want the resurrection. Who would come here today if you didn't want the resurrection? But we refuse the death. We refuse the burial. We can only be joined to Christ through dead and buried. I want to explain why I keep saying it. I'm going to read it very clearly from Romans chapter 6. I've talked about dead and buried and dead and buried and dead and buried. I want you to understand the foundation. It's not my opinion. It's Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning? So that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin... Here comes that death and burial. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in sin? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ, and and before I go on, I want you to know something. When you were joined with Christ, here's me, here's Jesus. When you were joined with Christ, the two of you became together. I am in Him, He is in me. And because I am in Him and He is in me, we are in the Father. That's the promise of God. And when we are joined with Jesus in baptism... We joined him in what? His death. Dead and buried. For we died. And we were raised with Christ when? In baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves of sin. For when we died, you see me times in the scripture, we die, we die, we die, we die. For when we died in Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and He will never die again. Death has no longer has any power over Him. And when He died, He died once. Why? To break the power of sin. But now that He lives, He lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. United with Christ. What does it mean? It is when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you united with christ i'll say it again jesus didn't come to save angels he didn't come to save himself he came to save us listen i want to describe it he came to save us from a dead and buried that doesn't have a resurrection are you listening there is a dead and buried that doesn't have a resurrection it's real It is to be dead and buried without Christ. 
It's called the place of the dead. And it's real. It's dead and buried without a resurrection. There is a way into the resurrection, into eternal life. But you've got to do it God's way. You can't do it your way. If you try your way, you're going to find dead and buried without the resurrection. But there is a dead and buried with the resurrection. Colossians 2.9 For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried, you were buried. Is this you? I'm asking everybody, is this you? You were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with Him you were raised to a new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Died with Him. Have you? Buried with Him. Have you? Raised with Him. Have you? He's not here. Everybody listen. He's not here. The angel said, He's not here. He is risen. Will they say that about you one day? He's not here. He is risen. I'm not talking about your spirit. I'm not talking about your soul. I'm talking about your physical body. There is a day on God's calendar when all the graves of believers are going to empty out. Do you understand that? The resurrection of the dead. It will happen in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. It will happen suddenly. And in that moment, two groups of people are going to experience a bodily resurrection. Listen very carefully. There's a day on God's calendar. There's going to be an event. It'll be so sudden, so quick. No one will be able to respond in the midst of it. Two groups of people are going to rise in the resurrection of Christ. One group are dead and buried. They're in the ground, in the grave. Been dead for a while. The other group... They're still alive. One of those groups is going to raise from the dust, from the grave, receiving eternal flesh as their soul, listen, as their soul returns with Christ at the sound of the final trumpet. If you stand at our house on Corinth Road and look backwards toward the west, you'll see the Corinth Christian Church Cemetery. That cemetery is on the hill, and I can see it from my house. And when my kids were young, we used to tell them the story that one day there's going to be a loud shout, and one day there's going to be a voice of the archangel and the trumpet blast of God. Now, we're telling our children this. I want them to know about what's coming. And we tell them that that because the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then maybe you standing in the yard, you might hear a a shout and a loud trumpet blast, and you look over toward the graveyard, and I don't know what kind of noise there will be, but there will be people coming out of the ground. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe this stuff? Because I do. There's a day coming that the dead in Christ... Them bones and bones and dry bones, they're going to rise. But there's a second group. Did you hear me? There's a second group. The other group will not raise from the dead. They're not in a graveyard. They're not in a coffin. They haven't turned to dust. And if I look around the room today, I'm going to say, right now, you qualify. You're alive and breathing air. You're not dead. They will also rise to receive eternal flesh and join the Lord in the clouds. Do you believe this stuff? Because this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is why He came. To both of these groups, it is promised resurrection. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, this only applies if you're in Christ. If you've already experienced the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in your own life, you've died to yourself, you've been buried with Christ in baptism and you've been raised to a new life, then this is you. Here we go. I want to read it to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful, a wonderful secret. We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment. 
in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, here it comes, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are still living, we who are living, will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. And our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the Scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up into victory. It will happen suddenly, without warning. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. And I'm going to tell you, if you're one of those in the room thinking, well, let's wait and see, it's too late. You will not convert in that moment. You will not believe in that moment. In that moment, you have missed it. And now for the biggest question. I have this question come to me all the time. What about the souls of believers who have been dead and buried in the earth since the time of Christ? What about Peter? The Bible says Peter was crucified upside down. I suppose he was dead and buried. What about Paul? They said they cut his head off. and He was dead and buried. What about your great-grandparents who were followers of Christ? What about them? They're dead and buried. They're, you can go to the graveyard and you can put flowers out there. What about Billy Graham? He just died, what, a couple years ago. If their bodies are in the ground, the question becomes, what about their souls? Are there souls? What about the souls? Does the Bible tell us about their souls? The Bible does tell us about their souls. I want to read it to you. This is the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen. We want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you'll not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, when's this going to happen? When He comes back. When Jesus returns, here He comes. God will bring back with Him the believers who have died. Are you with me? Their bodies are in the ground. But their soul has gone to be with Christ, waiting for the resurrection. When Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Why is he bringing them back here? Because that's where their bodies are. Listen, here's what's next. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living. This is the second group. You're not in the ground. You're still alive. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. We don't get to go first. They go first. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. And first, notice the order. What's going to happen first? When the trumpet goes off, what's going to happen first? First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Watch the graveyards. They will come from their graves. And then, notice the word then. As of right now, we all qualify for this category. Then, together with them, there's not a big time lag, together with them, but they get to go first. We who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we shall be with the Lord. How long? Say it out loud. Forever is a long time to be anywhere. Death, burial, resurrection, dead and buried, waiting for something big. No fear of death. Have you died with Christ? Then you have no fear of future death. Have you been buried with Christ? You've got no fear of future death. Why? It's called the resurrection. Are you waiting for the resurrection? The Apostle Paul says there's a crown of righteousness for everyone who is longing for his appearing. Is that you? Death, burial, resurrection. This is the story of Easter. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the message of eternal life. And I'm going to ask you the craziest question I've asked today. Who in the world would turn this down? There's only one answer. I've thought about this for so many years. There's only one answer. You don't believe it. Hell will be filled with unbelievers. 
you don't believe it. Hebrews 4.1. God's promise of entering His rest still stands. As of this moment, as of this second, God's promise of entering His rest through the death, burial, resurrection of Christ still stands. But so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. We ought to be totally afraid that somebody sitting in this room, in fact, I'll say, more than likely, there are numerous people sitting in this room that will fail to experience this rest. This is not a game. For this good news, that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. I'm talking about the Old Testament people. But it did them no good. Why? Why didn't it do them no good about this rest that God has prepared? It did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. They didn't share the faith. For only we who believe. Is this you? I'm asking you. I don't know. I won't judge your heart. I'm not going to stand in front of God in the last day. He's not going to ask me about you. It's between you and Him. He says this, For only we who believe can enter His rest. As for the others, God said, In my anger, in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my rest. Even though this rest has been ready since He made the world. God's promise, His offer still stands today. But I don't know how much longer that door will be opened. You won't be able to say you didn't know. You're not going to go out of here one day and stand before God and say, I didn't know, nobody told you. Yeah, yeah, you did know. Death, burial, and resurrection follow me. We must follow Jesus into all three to receive this promise. Knowing about the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ will do you no good until you receive it personally by faith. Knowing about Jesus' bodily resurrection will do you no good until you believe the promise for yourself that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. I want to read it to you. Do you know this? Romans 10, verse 6. Faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say. Don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth. And don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, here's what it says. It says this, this message is very close at your hand. It's within reach of every person in this room. This message is very close at hand. It's on your lips. It's in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. What is the message? If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. He's not here. He is risen. Do you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? Do you think this is a casual thing? It's by confessing with our mouth and believing that God raised him from the dead that we'll be saved. Do you believe God raised him from the dead? He didn't rise to be a spook, to be a ghost, did he? And neither will you. You will be you. Listen, I was raised in a church that never talked about a bodily resurrection. I was raised in a church that never talked about that I'll be raised, I'll be me. I'll just get a new body, but I'll still be me. That I'm not going to be some spirit floating around on a cloud eating cream cheese bars, whatever that commercial is. That you're going to be you in heaven. When Jesus rose from the dead, He appears after the resurrection. He's in a physical body. He's not a ghost. Let me read it to you, Luke 24. Jesus, He appears to them after His death and His burial, His resurrection. He says, look at my hands. Why? Look at my feet. Why? Because there's holes in them. There's scars on them. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me. Why? Because you can't touch a ghost. Your hand just goes right on through. I saw that on TV. Touch me. 
Touch me. Lay your hands on me. Make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies, as you can see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands. He showed them his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? He's got a physical body. He's not a ghost. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. And I wonder if they're watching to see if it drops out the bottom because he's a ghost. No, it didn't drop out the bottom. For the believers who are dead and buried, for the believers who are dead and buried in the grave, I think about my grandparents. I think about Billy Graham. They are going to rise to meet Jesus as Jesus brings back their souls. And he's going to bring back their souls. And he's going to rise their bones. And he's going to assemble a perfect body, human body. And he's going to take that soul and put it inside that human body as he meets them in the clouds. And there they shall be with the Lord forever. Do you know how big this is? Jesus did not come to rise from the dead because he needed eternal life. He came and rose from the dead because we had no hope without his sacrifice. But there's a second group. For the believers who have not yet died, and I'm going to say it again right now, you qualify. There will be a sudden, in a flash, transformation. He promises a sudden, in the flash, transformation of your current flesh as you rise to meet the Lord in the air. You won't be a ghost. And you won't be somebody else. You will be you, wrapped in glorified eternal flesh. And I'm going to ask you, do you believe this stuff? I stand up here and I preach this. This is the third time this weekend. I'm getting tired of hearing me. And I wonder, as I look across the crowd, I wonder if we have probably 1,400 people here this weekend. And I wonder how many people sitting in this room actually believe this stuff. But I'm warning you, if you do not really believe this stuff, you're not faking anybody out. You're just fooling you. And if you turn and walk out that door today, and you've got in your hands your life, and you're not dead and you're not buried in Christ, you will never know the resurrection. You will experience the place of the dead, and you will never get out. And it's within your reach. It's right in front of you. But you don't want to die to yourself. You don't want to surrender control of your life. You want your will your way. And your will your way ends in the place of the dead. One last thought. It's the very next verse after Jesus eats the fish. In his glorified body. Verse 44. And he said, Jesus said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. I'm going to tell you, everything in here is going to happen. Everything. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would off." would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was written a long time ago, so it had to happen. It was also written that this message, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in authority of his name to all the nations. What message? The one I just gave you today. Beginning in Jerusalem, this message was going to be proclaimed. And what is the foundation of this message? Here we go, here we go. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send you the Holy Spirit just as the Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with the power from heaven. So one last time I'm going to ask you. Have you been dead and buried in Christ? Let me be more specific. Because when you get dead and buried, means you've confessed your sin. You've admitted that you're a sinner before God. You tell God what he already knows. You're a sinner. 
I'm a sinner. I've been dead and buried. I've received the forgiveness of my sins. Have you repented? What did Jesus say? There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. There is forgiveness. But I've got to ask a question. It's a logical question. What if you don't? There's forgiveness of sins. You can be made right with God through repentance. But what if you don't? What if you refuse? There is no repentance. There is no forgiveness without repentance. You will remain in the place of the dead. If you are not raised from the dead, think logically, if you are not raised from the dead, if you do not experience the resurrection of the dead, you will forever stay in the place of the dead because the resurrection is the only way out. It's not optional. He's not here. He has risen from the place of the dead. Will they say that about you one day? Or will you remain in the grave waiting for the second death? You know what the second death is? The assignment to hell. And you never get out. Or will you remain on the earth? Maybe you miss that resurrection of the living and you remain on the earth and you live through the tribulation and face death that way. Will somebody say about you one day, he's not here. He is risen. They will say that about me one day. You know why? Somebody says that's arrogance. No, that's confidence. Because faith is being sure and certain. Sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. If you're not sure and certain of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not called faith. Everything written in the Bible is going to happen. I'm going to ask Chad to come out for the invitation. And we're going to do something today very specific. See, I believe that baptism is part of God's plan of salvation. Water doesn't save you. Faith saves you. But faith says that you should be baptized. So you should be baptized. So we've got a guy standing by today that's going to do baptisms. This baptism will be open. And if you have not been buried with Christ in baptism, I ask you, what are you waiting for? So there's a guy who will be over here, and he's ready to do baptisms today. We're not going to make anybody do it. You've got to volunteer to delay your life down and be dead and buried in Christ. But if you want to, that's available. And we also all open this altar today. Maybe today there's sin in your life that you need to leave here today. You don't need to go out that door with that sin. You need to tell God. You don't need to tell me. You need to tell God today that sin. You need to repent of that sin, and you need to leave that sin here today and ask Him to forgive you of that sin. So we're going to celebrate. We're going to sing a song. We're going to celebrate together, and we'll let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. Father, in Jesus' name, let the Spirit's wind blow and let the fire of God fall and accomplish your work in Jesus' name. Let's stand. The invitation's open.